Tonight we have a wonderful group of practitioners here to have a conversation with us tonight um, to talk about games writing and its intersections with more traditional screenwriting, um, which is a fascinating line that is becoming more and more irrelevant as the days go on. Um, they're being blurred at a rapid rate um, with screenwriting courses around the country beginning to explore such concepts um, as immersion, agency, choice, um, and, and these things are normally notions confined to game design degrees, so it's really exciting to see um, some, some mingling between the disciplines happening, so we're going to be talking about that tonight. Um, uh, we're starting to see it really, really evidently in things like uh, the Melbourne International Film Festival this year having a VR category and virtual reality is starting to be that conduit between um, getting screenwriters to start thinking about, about games and, and how putting someone in the art will change the art. Um, and it's, something is shifting and I can't wait to talk to these panellists tonight about that in more detail. On to them now. James Kokia is a writer and game developer, developer from Melbourne um, who's written for League of Geeks and is a contributor at thehilariouscracked.com. Please welcome him. <laughs> <clears throat> Brooke Maggs is a freelance writer, narrative designer and producer working with the Voxel agents on The Gardens Between, an adventure puzzle game with no text or speech. Mm. Um, she's also the narrative designer on Earthlight, um, a virtual reality game about the wonders and perils of space for Opaque Media Group. Um, Brooke has taught game studies, user experience design and cultural studies at a tertiary level for over seven years now. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> That's some fans. Look at that. <laughs> And she's brought a posse. Um, Trent Custers is a writer and game designer and founded game development collective League of Geeks that I mentioned previously with James, um, responsible for uh, the digital role-playing strategy board game and international success story, Armello. I wrote that part. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's uh, the board chair of the Free Play Independent Games Festival, um, Australia's longest-running independent games festival, um, and a lecturer at the Victorian College of the Arts. Please join me in welcoming him. So even though screenwriting courses are, are remaining as popular as ever, um, very few students are writing traditional screenplays as we would have known them um, in the past. Instead, they're writing for the web, for interactive shorts, um, and very often for video games as well. So the core elements of storytelling uh, are still there between both. Um, games demand tightly constructed worlds, rich with theme, um, character, plot, dialogue, you know, very similar things are required in both and a consideration for implication as well. Um, and for gamers whose actions influence the storylines and outcomes of these worlds, connection to story is absolutely key. Um, so the expectation for most modern games is that the narrative will be appropriately complex in some places um, and, and they're backed up sometimes by literally thousands of pages of law as well. So there is a lot of writing involved in the game's world. Um, tonight, let's look at the way uh, writers can seize on the creative and collaborative potential of games um, and explore the ways in which the line between, excuse me, I'm very ill, uh, <laughs> between writer and games writer may be um, blurring to the point of... of um, obscurity maybe. But first we need to understand that distinction between the two a little bit better I think. So um, my first question to the panel um, would be what's the hardest thing about switching from a linear writing mindset um, to an interactive one when writing for games? Um, why is it something that screenwriters don't necessarily automatically know how to do? Um, I guess to distill that, what's so special about interactive writing that makes it hard? Well, I started out as a traditional writer, I suppose you would say. I um, wrote short stories and working on uh, a novel at the moment and it was because of one of my short stories 
that I was recommended to write for The Gardens Between. But bridging that gap has been interesting, going from um, a, you know, I guess, non-interactive medium to an interactive medium where you first have to ask um, the player, you know, opens up your story or your game and says, okay, so what do I do? Um, instead of, you know, starts absorbing a story. So they very much have actions that need to be rationalised by the story as well. So the story provides a context for what the player is doing, which means that I learn to work really collaboratively with the rest of my team to be able to do that properly. Um, you know, whereas when I was writing my short stories, I didn't need to collaborate with anyone. I could sort of just do that however I wanted to. But um, writing for uh, games meant that I had to think about how what I wrote impacted on everyone else in the team, you know, technically, artistically, how the story would sit, especially with the gardens between because there's no text or speech. We tell the story with the environment, with the colour palettes, with um, the gameplay. So I very much... <laughs> my job really is to communicate the story to the team and then help them sit with them and communicate it to the player. So I went from, um, you know, I would write a, write a little scene for how the game would start and then one of the key questions the team would ask me is... Mm, good, but how do we show that? I was like, yes. <laughs> so I would sit there with a with a notepad, and I stopped, ended up stopped writing a lot of things. Instead, started writing dot points, and then would sit with a sketch pad between myself and the artist. My terrible stick figures <laughs> were not great, but we would still figure out a way to show visually what was going on, and then how the gameplay and interactivity worked over the top. Mm. Great. James, you were more recently a student than the rest of us on this stage, so it might be a bit more fresh in your mind that first time you actually sat down and tried to make a story that had more than one path. Mm. Did you cry? Was there fire? Was there blood? Mm. Um, <laughs> how was that? Can you remember that, that day that it clicked? Vaguely. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest challenge, I think, was trying to figure out the very basics of writing for a medium that's still very new and has a lot of things that aren't fixed within it. People kind of inherently understand a book, um, but you can totally get a situation with games where you could put someone in front of a computer and they would have no idea what's going on and wouldn't understand how to interact with the product, where you don't really have a situation where you put someone in front of a book and they're sort of scratching at the spine going, Look, I, just, mm -hmm. I just don't get it. So I think that learning basic things like how to write a branching script, how to be able to plot storylines um, without having the fallback of like a Hollywood script convention or standard novel plans and three-act structure plans was probably the most difficult part. Um, mm. It took quite a while to click and it's still clicking mm. and it's still so open that I think that I will continue to attempt to click for quite a while. Mm. Trent, are you still clicking? <laughs> is it an ongoing process? Yeah, it is an ongoing process because every game is different. different. So mm -hmm. every game has a whole new set of mechanics that you need to teach a player or might be targeting a completely different audience or, you know, it could be on a whole different platform or now if you're writing for VR, it's like a whole different way to interface with the medium entirely. So, yeah, definitely. And, of course, the subject matter changes. I think one thing is that, you know, a lot of, like... If you, get, if you pick up a book, right, you pick it up and you open the first page and you start reading. Um, and obviously there are some exceptions to that, but every game can be vastly different in how you interact with it. The genre, like, the genre doesn't just change what type of story, it actually changes the actions that you're going to be doing. But it potentially to like maybe boil down a bit of like what's been said is that that real out random element is the player like that at the end of the day that's the big point of difference and it's like okay yeah of, of course that's obvious but so I I wrote the curriculum for the writing for games module in um, VCA screenwriting degree and the first thing that I did was or in the course when I was teaching it is I just tell the students I get them up and running in twine which is a little interactive uh text program I guess you would say and I just say write a game write like an interactive branching story just make it a real shitty story I don't care if it's good or bad just write it and the whole exercise is not to see if they're good writers I mean it's a folio selected course they're in their second year now these kids or adults in the course know how to write so it's just about getting them to trip over the first few steps and those first few steps are watching people play your game and go, oh, that's not what I wanted them to do. Or 
watching them balloon out into all these different threads. And there are all these first sort of, I guess, <laughs> issues that you come across, all these little nooks and crannies and problems that you'd never expected mm. when you first start writing for interactive media that just throwing yourself in the deep end can get you through. And I, th- and I think that's the big thing is being aware of the player and the player's state and being able to relinquish control and instead of being like, I am God, I am the author, say, you are the actor and both the director, how can we help write a story together? Yeah, that's I. That's exactly how I felt too the first time. Letting go was very hard for me because <laughs> I uh, liked that strict authored experience. But um, sometimes a game's only as good as its player, unfortunately, and that's really True. confronting sometimes if you want to have a specific game that you want to make. Um, sort of leading on from that, uh, what can screenwriters and games writers learn from each other? Um, is this the start of a, a beautiful friendship? Um, you know, if, if what could they teach each other if they sat down and said, if you want to, if you want to have a go at making what I make, here's what you should know, and the other way around. Or what could what could a games writer tell a screenwriter that might surprise them or interest them? Well, I think screenwriters could teach a thing or two to games writers about how to write good dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a fantastic talk from GDC around 2011 which uh, film writer, uh, screenwriter David Freeman talks about advanced dialogue techniques and it's one of the best talks that's been given at a games conference ever. And it's and it's a lot of that stuff that, you know, screenwriters, I think good ones, take, take for granted is just, you know, that the rhythms of natural speech are completely counterintuitive and all these types of things. Um, and I think there are other things like TV shows, long form... Uh, screen media, like, you know, your TV serials and stuff, they're very... There's a lot of that that you could transfer over to games and I don't think we see enough of that. Um, And I'm sure there's a lot that games writing could could teach to screenwriters. I would never make a case of what that would be. But, yeah, yeah, there's definitely more sharing to be had and I I think we're seeing more of that as we go on. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, screenwriters are very amazingly structured in the way that they have to work, which I think helps. Um, But that might also be something that the games writer doesn't always have the privilege of, depending what project that they're working on. Mm -hmm. I think both writers understand, because they're both collaborative mediums, um, that the story bends and changes according to production and according to what what happens. But especially with a games writer, um, you know, you, you kind of craft the story understanding that it could dramatically change next week. (laughs) Um, And that's okay, you know, um, but I used a traditional story structure for The Gardens Between and it actually works quite well because we can sort of pad out how many levels or less levels we can have in each section of the game, Um, but not all games, you know, necessarily lend to that either. Um, So, you know, I think both... Screenwriters and games writers have the same story tools or understand, you know, plot and characterization and dialogue to a certain extent, but um, how they execute those can be quite different, I think. It's actually, you kind of just touched on something that I think games writers are incredibly good at, which is modular writing. So within a game you're looking to embody or sort of create an experience for someone to dive into and, Mm. well, experience, right? And you do that through a number of scenarios and you may come along and just have someone chop it or it may not work, it may not play test well or whatever the reason is or players may be playing completely different characters. I mean, I had to write a game once, a Scooby-Doo game, and there, where you could hot swap in any of Mystery Inc. at any given time. And so I had to write five lines of dialogue for every single line in the game. Mm. And that's the sort of thing that I think that approach to storytelling where it's completely modular and the end goal is the player experience, I, th- I think is something that that could be incredibly useful to people who write in a linear format. And, and people who write in a linear format might be surprised to know that um, there are different states of the game that you need to write for, so different mm. characters. So for Earthlight, we have to predict what the player might do wrong <laughs> in order to write the dialogue for that. Help so them. if they're doing a puzzle and they drop a drill, we need to have dialogue for, hey, pick up the drill. We need to have dialogue for, get back on track. We need to have dialogue for... So we need to sort of work with the game designers to predict what might happen to build a context but also help the player to get back on track and help that be believable as well. 
you know, within the character's personality to give that direction to get back on track. Yeah, it's still got to flow. It's still got to work it's, in context. Yeah, exactly. So you find yourself <laughs> writing in a spreadsheet <laughs> rather than, you know, writing um, with um, with a script, you know, writing program. So, yeah, that's interesting too. And the heartbreaking thing that I think a lot of screenwriters would come across when they start to make games is that not all of your genius will ever be witnessed. There will be some parts of, yeah. of your work that yeah. probably won't ever get read and that's very different for a screenwriter who has a very authored, um, you know, view of almost sitting you there with your eyes peeled open, watch, you know, <laughs> you will watch what I'm about to tell you. Um, you have to let go of a bit of that. Did you feel that, James, when you were studying um, in a screenwriting course and doing a games elective, um, did you feel like um, studying games made you a better screenwriter? Um, absolutely. I, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trent was, that was your course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> I did the module that Trent uh, taught and I also did the VCA screenwriting course. Yep. Um, one thing that I found really interesting is that and this might be, I believe it's a trend for a lot of modern screenwriting courses and a lot of the kind of screenwriting industry at the minute is it's very open-ended and people are encouraging screenwriters to look at podcasts, film, TV, series. They're encouraging people to think in terms of serials and also in terms of like a Netflix binge. So there's all these different ways of watching media. Um, you're not always there with your eyes kind of Ludovico machined open, as you mm -hmm. described. And games writers thinking in a modular way and being able to respond to people um, absorbing their media in radically different senses is one of the things that I think will be particularly useful to screenwriters who want to work within diverse fields of media like podcasts, um, mm. TV, web series. I think games writing teaches a flexibility that will be really useful for anyone who wants to work within that field. Very yeah. interesting, yeah. Jamie and I, primarily Jamie, wrote 250,000 lines of text for Armello. Mm, and wow. you, through any given game, you would probably encounter like 1% of that in one playthrough. So that gives you, yeah, that gives you an idea of sort of how much you can put down and how much can be experienced in just one playthrough. But that also means that players can, you know, have their own ex completely different experiences with the same game. Yep. Um, and, and that's why we do it, right? That, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so there's also the story that the player tells themselves about the game that they play, which is not necessarily something that happens with film either, um, you know, you say, oh, and then I went over here and I did this and I did that and I went and did you end up going down that way? No, I didn't, but, you know, and then that opens up a, like even like a bit of a meta story that sits on top. Um, but, yeah, there's the – every player will have a slightly different experience with the same game. Which is interesting. Well, it's too. almost like we're making story machines, right? And yeah. we're just like we're just writing into Excel. Like I know writers that have actually reached the bottom of Excel. Like that's how much text you can actually. There's really? Write. Bottom? Is there a bottom? Yeah, there's a bottom. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, they might have patched it since, but yeah, the, same, the writers on Saints Row found the bottom of uh, found the bottom yeah. of Excel. Oh, so I want to send them flowers or something. <laughs> yeah. That's awful. So we just you know we just put words and like just bits, really abstract bits completely out of order into these string tables and it goes into this weird machine that creates <laughs> stories for players and mm. it's such a beautiful beautiful thing and as you know some of the this is the weird thing when people ask about writing in games or writing for games is that some of the best stories told in games don't even have text you know they're just mm. stories created uh, like the guy that's between oh, good, good time for a plug um <laughs> When the players are just able to create their own stories through the actions that they yep. do and if you can have some text there or if you can have some visuals there or some audio or whatever tools it is that we that we pull on and, you know, we were talking before about how do you communicate this story? Like that's really the role of narrative design, right, which is something mm. that you don't have in a lot of linear, linear mediums. It's something kind of unique to games where there is a role or a responsibility directly responsible for how does the player get this piece of story now? How are we communicating that to them? And sometimes you have to create entire mechanics or features or mm. 
asset lists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I do for Earthlight too is if our character has a desk, um, what is the minimum amount of assets I could have on that desk to convey her personality? Because, of course, the more assets <laughs> is more uh, time and money. So mm -hmm. I have my minimum assets, so a coffee cup, an engagement ring, and I don't know, a, yeah. a photo of the family. And then my plus is like some other th personal effects that we can convey. So as the narrative designer, they're the other things that you write that, of course, never make it into the game, but that are crucial to your role. So you, you then I have conversations with art and say, can can I have these things, please? <laughs> and then talk to tech about a dialogue system that will rate, you know, how player, how um, characters feel about you depending on if you succeed or not. And if we have that complicated dialogue system, I have to track it in a spreadsheet and rewrite. If this character is angry at you minus one, then they respond like this. If they're angry at you minus two, they respond to you like this. And then that's the the lines of dialogue that I write. So It's really interesting, yeah. isn't it? Like those technical... I remember I, <laughs> I wrote on a script when... It, this is when I first started out writing games almost ten years ago and I wrote on a script um, for a cut scene in a game and the crowd cheers and I gave it to our animation director and he's like... Are you paying for the crowd? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we can't just call up extras. We've got to make all these models. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then I remember on another game, I, <laughs> um, I was told that we didn't have budget for one of the characters. We had to cut an NPC, a non-player controlled character, just a character that you meet in the world that had dialogue and everything. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I've already written all the story. And they were like, well, it's not going to make it in the game. So I had to go back and rewrite this dialogue I had to get re really clever with it. So I decided, I said, what if you could just give me like, you know, American style basement doors that just did that? Can you give me that? And they were like, yeah, we can do that. So I just wrote that the character was hiding in the basement. <laughs> and so you had to, you just talk to them through basement doors. <laughs> Nice. And, um, you know, so the, super creative. Yeah, yeah, so there's yeah. all these really interesting ways that we work with deadlines and, you know, trying to achieve this story with these incredible mm. technical um, constraints oh, yeah. of the medium. Yeah. We call that being agile. <laughs> we do. <laughs> very you, agile. Yes. Very agile. We're very agile. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did a similar adaptable. things with Gardens Between when I first came on. I was, I was like, oh... And um, Frent slips off the side of the mountain and Arena jumps and grabs him and pulls him back up and I'm like showing it and Henrik, our creative director, was like, we nope. can lift an arm <laughs> <laughs> once. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so we'll put that arm raising at the end of the game as like a woo or something and then uh, the rest we can see what we can do. <laughs> yep. I think the, uh, the closest thing screenwriters might be able to empathise with in terms of, uh, of that kind of scenario would be Wanting really grand establishing shots, yeah, right, and, yeah. You know, um, yeah. But uh, and as a helicopter not... cranes over the yeah. right. Grand Canyon, well, I guess Canyon. now we've got drones, so yeah, you know true. it's much cheaper. Mm. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily change the whole world. No. Um, speaking of VR, we did that. We did mention that very briefly just just now, um, especially with the recent uh, popularization of it, and it's getting a bit cheaper, so it's getting a, a lot more coverage and a lot more action with people. Um, we're seeing that that line again blurring between game and film on a much larger scale, and um, the VR symposium at MIF comes to mind, um, and also a, a really large um, amount of VR experiences at Tribeca Film Festival as well um, in New York. Um, this may be a bit of a chicken and an egg question, <laughs> uh, so forgive me. But um, do you think a lot of these projects are filmmakers? Um, exploring interactivity or game makers telling particularly filmic stories? I think the first one. Yeah, beyond I doubt. agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, because I think a lot of the exploration, I mean, that I heard at the film festival was talking about, you know, because VR is 360, you know, you can look around and, you know, you, um, the filmmakers were talking about the fact that they needed to write outside of the frame and think about what's happening outside of the frame um, and to which I was thinking, well, yes, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that 3D world <laughs> that we create in games. Um, and so I think, yes, exploring interactivity is, was perhaps the emphasis of that conversation that I noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like a, it's a weird thing to say, but it's almost like a passive interactivity as well, you know, like you're, yeah. you're looking at, you're sort of passively observing or interacting with the environment. Uh, uh, 
I heard a term that a lot of VR filmmakers are now calling the audience as the observer when referring to VR film, which is a pretty mm. apt term, I think. Oh, the yeah. observer. Yeah, the it's observer. so creepy, right? It is creepy. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's like, who's your friend? That's yeah, the observer. That's the observer. That's the observer. Oh. Yeah. Mm. No. There's like, there's a Pixar plot in that where they refer to the observer. Oh, the observer. The observer. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's strange. I think that... Um, I think that generally anyone that I know in games tinkering around with games is kind of just making games but in the way that they sort of always have now with the with a whole lot more interactivity mm. and immersion, I guess you would say, um, to use yeah. the dirty word. So, And I think a lot of people – and it's, it's only natural, right? You're a filmmaker, you get this new piece of tech and you're like, whoa – Think of all the ways I can make film now with this tech. And you're a game maker, you get the piece of tech, you're like, well, think of all the ways I can make games. Yeah. I think that's only – it's a natural extension of both uh, both roles. Mm. Um, did you have – you're oh, working on just, VR at the just, moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of things that come up for us when we're writing for VR, um, myself and the uh, scriptwriter Claire, we think about can, can we move the player? So at the moment – with games, obviously, you can move your characters. With VR, it, well, the one we're designing for is a seated experience, so the player's not actually moving. So we need to put them into positions where there's something interesting for them to look at. Which is why I was saying the desk before is you're naturally seated at a desk, so that environment works. And then in VR, you can pick things up and look at them and turn them around and look all around your environment. So we have to think about locations where that's interesting and where there's enough story that can be told with that stationary um, with that stationary I guess way of interacting mm -hmm. and observing um, so yeah that's interesting it's, it's a different kind of writing too so you have to I think there's something really interesting way. with how game developers approach technical problems or the impacts that a n that new technical constraints have on the medium and on their craft yeah. and their ability to express themselves within mm. their chosen medium because it's what we've been working with forever. I mean, it used to be like clockwork. Every six years you'd get a new console and, hey, guess what? This one has motion controls that kind of don't work and this one has <laughs> a connect that watches you in the lounge room all the time and, and there's always – or this is a phone and it's touch controls so – have fun, you know, like that's what games has been for 60 years almost. Mm. And on now it's changing at such a rapid rate that there aren't console generation cycles. It's just new tech is coming in all the time, new ways to interact with the medium. And it's phenomenal. It's half the reason why a lot of us are here because the challenge is incredible. But I think what that creates is a bunch of people who are very good at getting their hands on new tech or a new way to interact with something and solving those problems very, very fast. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's an excellent point. Um, would you like to tell us any more about your VR game just before we move on out of our little VR um, section? <laughs> oh, well, something that was just jumping to mind was that, you know, writing for games I think is very technical, you know, because you do totally. have to – it totally helps if you understand those technical limitations. Mm. So a part of this – as a part of this project I – I'm trying to make sure and still make sure that I'm talking to the people who are making it and, you know, watch them and talk to tech and talk to art and say, what are your considerations for this and what's game design's goal for this? How are you making this interaction interesting for the player um, and how? what are the goals for the game? So the game is to create, you know, the most realistic, immersive, I guess, astronaut training experience. So we're thinking of ways to help that through with the narrative and, mm. you know, setting a context for that medium. But in terms of um, VR-specific things, it's, yeah, it's dealing with those technical limitations of the player can't move but that still needs to be interesting. We need to put them in story-rich environments. But it also means that we can plant props. It's, it's almost like it's stage design, set design and mm. things like that. It's sort of – a lot of comparison is drawn between VR and theatre as well, which is – I think maybe maybe a more helpful comparison when it comes to the um, mm. the things that you need to consider when writing for it. So yeah, those were my thoughts. So mm. the the what I'm picking up tonight, and and I've been musing on for quite a while, and I'm sure a lot of other people in this room are too. That's why you're here. Is how just how many disciplines are going to be involved in making stories told in a VR um, sort of way? Mm. We've got theatre makers, we've got game makers, we've got filmmakers and, and screenwriters and imagine who else we could, like, 
invite to the party and, and mm. make mm. amazing things. Um, but more on that a little bit later. Um, so awards play a really big part in the screenwriting industry um, in the world and to a lesser extent the games world. Um, for example, our awards are not televised and they are not as uh, glamorous. Um, <laughs> but would there be value in, say, an interactive or a, a, a VR category at the Academy Awards? Um, would you think? Like uh, we have games winning BAFTAs. That's a thing that does happen. Um, mm. Uh, but would there be any any benefit to makers or the the cultural conversation around games um, if we held up our finest in this way? Um, and and what impact could that have here locally? Do you think? That's such mm. a curveball question. Yeah, it I is. It. It's it's tricky. There are a number of things that jump to mind. Mm. Um, I think anyone doing cool stuff with VR is good for games. Like, if I can speak to my interests, like, you know... You may. I want to I, <laughs> I, I wanna, I wanna say that my life doesn't revolve around games, but everything that I do has something to do with games. It's bloody depressing. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Um, but, you know, my interests in, in this is if... VR, okay, put it this way. I want to work in VR. I love VR. The first time I put on a Vive and a huge whale flew past me, I was like, done, I'm sold. This is, this is the <laughs> Matrix, jack me in. <laughs> I want to know Kung Fu. Yep. And, but there is no financial case right now for me to take our studio of 12 people and put them to work for a year to two years or three years um, on the scope of game that we want to make for VR. There's no financial case for it mm. whatsoever, zero, uh, and that ship has sailed. Maybe there was at some point when Oculus was handing out that sweet Facebook money, but that's not around anymore. So if the film industry wants to come along and put <laughs> VR in the headlights and have a, film, ha- have a film category and get a vibe in every household, then go for it, pals. I'm, all, I'm down because I'll, <laughs> I'll get to make my VR game. <laughs> they have permission now. Yeah. Thank you, the Academy. Um, what um, do you think, James? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I went to a, a Kaleidoscope, which was a VR festival a couple of um, months ago, and... Um, uh, exactly what Trent was saying. It's, it's, it was a very difficult situation because there was limited tech available and you had this huge station for um, Samsung Gear VR, which is just uses a phone and like a kind of uh, plastic headset that you can put around. And everyone kind of went through that in about five minutes and then there were just these queues out the door for the two Vives and two Oculuses that they had set up. So no one really got to experience those um, and and one thing that I noticed, which I wanted to ask uh, you about, Brooke, actually, is I, I, know, I noticed a lot of the VR films that were coming out really used, um, although they would ha- be really interesting, they had a they were often very focused forward. Mm. So you'd be put in a three D environment, and you'd look behind you once, and you'd see something it. moderately cool, and then you wouldn't be required to look behind you. Uh, some of them were even in cinemas, mm. um, and just looking at a screen which is cool, but it didn't feel like it was using the, the tech to its full capacity. Yeah, I mean, I've had some experiences where that's been the case. I mean, I saw um, The Turning Forest at the film festival, and that was amazing. Like, I really loved that. Like, that was my VR experience that made me go, yeah, <laughs> totally on board yeah, with I'm this. Sold. Like, I want one at home. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. that was beautiful, just being able to be within that uh, fairy tale esque um, environment and there were things going on encouraging you to look around but then again VR experiences need to by nature at the moment be quite small because it gets super uncomfortable to have that mask on looking around you mm. know hurting your neck all the time turning and twisting and um, motion but, sickness is a but thing no but it was the perfect length that one um, and but but that is a limitation of the medium at the moment um, the what I perceive anyway um, because you know sort of somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes and that's sort of how we're trying to write mm. Earthlight in these 15 these to 20 bars. minute blocks of time that allow players to take a rest too, you know, factoring in that rest time and downtime mm. where they don't feel like they're going to miss out on anything if they take the mask off and have a rest. Mm. But by the same token, we also want them to feel like they need to come back <laughs> and keep going. Um, in terms of awards and things like that, I think it's – I don't know how to place them. I think awards – uh, interesting in and of themselves but I mean if just some way to bring games and VR storytelling in general to more to more people would be great just for the visibility would be wonderful mm. um, but I don't know if awards are the best way to do that but I definitely think that 
you know, games as a are a cultural medium, like they're so important and, yeah, showing some light on them would be good. To go back to Jamie's question mm. about there being a focal point in VR, I think it's just, like, we have that in games as well. Like, we've been working in 3D worlds for, you know, forever in games pretty much. But you still we're still trying to drive the player towards something we're trying to give get their attention you know like put the spotlight on the car over there so they know to go to the car because that's where the items are whatever it may be and it's like when you have a story whether it be interactive or linear there are going to be plot points right and mm-hmm. they're called points for a reason because everything sort of comes together there and that and you need the person to experience that or pass through that plot point in particular so we're constantly trying to funnel people through it's one of the greatest challenges of open world design in video games it's like how do we get them to funnel through these plot points. You said open world. I know, I'm sorry. I also <laughs> said immersion, so I, I put know. two on the scoreboard. Oh, that's uh, two strikes. <laughs> two strikes. Um, but I think this is something where VR will find its feet in other ways. One of my favourite and I think one of the most accomplished VR experiences that you can find out there, and it's amazing because it's been around pretty much since the birth of this latest iteration of VR, is Daniel Ernst's Um, dioramas. He's a developer, a VR developer based in the Netherlands and he makes these incredible dioramas where you're just sitting in a room because, you know, it's a seated experience like you say. You're sitting in a room and you're just looking around the room and around the room are these amazing, incredible, like hundreds of them, points of interest and it's just this experience. And actually when he does installations, there's one where you put the VR headset on and you're sitting atop a stack of chairs like 100 metres in the air And it's sort of wobbling a bit and the breeze is going past you and there's all like there's Mm. things set up around you like tea uh, coffee tables and everything. But in the installation, you actually have to climb up a bunch of stacks chairs to sit on it. And I think it's experiences like these where people will actually take the room scale stuff that the vibe is doing and create these these fully rounded experiences where we get really really talented at finding ways to funnel the player through those plot points or having the player explore and find their own ways through it. But I, I think having things focused is just one of those <laughs> those first early tripping points. Mm, that you work out. Yeah. Great point. Um, <clears throat> my sincere apologies. It must be awful to listen to. Um, but I can't help it. So um, speaking of uh, awards and sort of a, the legitimacy that may come with them or may not, that's a, probably a discussion for a whole another evening. Um, what barriers do game makers face in terms of, and this might be my third strike by saying <laughs> this word, for finding funding um, for, for projects that screenwriters may not? So um, there's a number of, of um, funding bodies that will not talk to games makers who will gladly talk to screen um, screen artists. Um, can anything be done to apply pressure to large arts funding bodies to um, to get them to talk about games? And, and if this line is blurring between screenwriters and games makers, uh, are we going to scare them off? Are we going to, you know, is our presence going to be negative to these screenwriters in, the, in these projects? Um, we can talk about collaboration between the disciplines all we like and even, you know, posit a new kind of maker that might be coming out of this. But um, if funding bodies like Screen Australia refuse anything with the word game in it, um, I, I'm worried about how how far we're actually going to get to 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 go with this and how we proceed with this new this new romance. What do you think is going to happen to the funding landscape if we do play with screenwriters more? Hmm. It's really interesting. I think in the short term it's like, you know, it would produce... It's kind of like, hey, look, we're, we're playing well together. Can we get our dessert later? Is that cool? Yeah. Thanks, you know, thanks <laughs> yeah. Mom. Thanks, Dad. I think there's definitely a, an element of that right now. But I also think the bullet train that is the cultural legitimacy of video games is stopping all stations and it left the first station a long time ago. Mm. And I think that, you know, a particularly large funding body that recently cut video games, um, there are a lot of fantastic people who work there and are champions of the medium and it really just comes from the old guard who understand nothing about video games just coming and putting a red pen through a figure of money that they were like, mm, games. Mm. Um And so as more people who have grown up with video games being the aesthetic form of their generation, Mm. um, that's it's so ubiquitous since they were in primary school, they've been walking around with games in their pocket, uh, we will 
begin to see those avenues open up. I mean, you go to, like you interface with students all the time, mm. I'm the same, and when you see the way that they talk about video games, there's this really strange thing in the video game industry at large or the medium at large where we have this inferiority complex or we have this legitimacy complex and we're constantly trying to prove ourselves. But if you talk to students today, they don't feel that. Mm. They don't feel that at all because they've grown up in not just interacting with video games, but them being a major part of their life mm. forever in a, in a mainstream way as well, not just like, oh, our mum got an, an Amiga and we used to code on it at home or something like that. It's like, no, they literally have been playing games every day of their life forever. And I think when the, the old guard goes and those people just start to bleed into positions mm. around the place that are actually signing the checks on these funding and sitting on the boards... It's just not going to be a question. I mean, the financial argument's been there forever and the cultural one is already here. It's just people realising it. Can we have our revolution, please? <laughs> um, yeah, Brooke, do you have anything to say about the funding future of this oh, sort of collaborative um, work? I don't profess to know much about, uh, as much as Trent perhaps knows about the different funding bodies around. I know that we are... Or well, our project has been supported by Film Victoria um, and they do a spectacular job mm. of supporting the games industry. They do. They're yes. awesome. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, there are funding rounds coming out all the time from, from them, which is mm. spectacular. And, yes, if there were more... Maybe there is, like, lots of opportunity to, you know, have other funding bodies present these the ways of funding so for example can encourage those collaborations between mm. um screen and games so you know we will fund a narrative project with screen people attached and with games people attached see what you can make um that would be super lovely i mean i'm very optimistic so but <laughs> i think that you know i think funding bodies have the opportunity to drive that cultural shift and those opportunities between mm. industries as well by offering up those things so you know here's some money you want to do some vr get some film people grab some games people um obviously it's not that simple but um <laughs> they can certainly you know that can certainly help yeah. um yeah and i think trent's right in terms of just the natural cultural shift between attitudes for games as well you know it's not really that uncommon for me to find people around my age who are shy about saying they play games still, you know, uh, some of them are, some of them aren't, but um, and then admitting, admitting you make games, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. great too. And, you know, people um, are always, people even who don't know much about games are fascinated by that and they ask mm. me a lot about what that's like and, you know, how do you do it and what does that mean? And um, I think... You know, I firmly believe that there's a, a game out there for everyone. I, you know? I do too. That, um, that, that's a big part of the course that I run at, at VCA is like I come in because they're not – not all of them are into games. You know, they might just be screenwriters and they might actually hate games and I've had a, uh, had a couple of those instances. But through the course of 10 weeks and showing them all of the very different experiences that people can have um, with video games, that's – Pretty astounding. Yeah, 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 it's pretty astounding. Like you show, uh, you know, there was a, a young girl in, our, in in your class who hated video games, thought they were a joke. But when you show her that, you know, it's not just ninja Shooting. parkour assassins, you know, <laughs> that there's a game out there about, you know, a 13-year-old girl struggling with her sexual identity while her bigger sister's away on gap, you know, on a gap year, mm. then things start to resonate, you know. Mm. I think that's a beautiful note to end on because we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to open up uh, to some audience questions now. We've got two roving, roving, roving microphones. Um, this event's being recorded, so if you could wait until you get the microphone to start asking your question, that would be much appreciated. Um, and, and if you could make sure that your question is a question, that would also be very, very much appreciated as well. Um, yes. First of all, thank you. That was a really good panel. Uh, and seeing so many people here uh, who care about the same thing makes me feel less lonely. Aww. Uh, Aww. Right. It's, it's really <laughs> Games nice. Games bring people together. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> but my real, the actual question is, um, there are people out there who are writing software and artificial intelligence to replace uh, a large part of what you guys do uh, in terms of writing dialogue and plot points and so on. Um, <laughs> uh, this panel's it, over, by the way. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's enough, okay. Please and, what? This <laughs> and, and this is exciting. Um, uh, but are there any examples you can point to of ones that you're excited about or that you think might be the future 
of mm. generative story, storytelling. Yeah. Go, Can Jamie. I jump in with something? Cool, because I'm really interested in like yeah, procedural generation. Yeah, I'm super interested in this as well. And, uh, I, I think that uh, there's definitely a lot of amazing stuff that's being done with uh, procedural story generation. Um, one of the ones I love to talk about is Dwarf Fortress, which has an amazing narrative to it. But I also think that there's always going to be a, a space for uh, writers developing amazing stories. And one of the best examples I, uh, I think of when I'm considering something that completely occurred because of uh, computerized error is stories that arise from glitches. So about ten, 10 years ago yesterday, there was a really huge World of Warcraft glitch. Um, and I might get the name of it wrong, but the Corrupted Blood glitch. Do any of you guys know oh, about this? I remember yeah. that. So a giant glitch happened in World of Warcraft. There where, was a lot of nodding. Yeah, yeah, everyone's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh -huh. Dark yeah, They were all there. Yeah, they were raiding <laughs> when it happened. Exactly. So <laughs> basically, um, long story short, a, 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 an attack would infect a player and then they could carry it into like oh, main yeah. cities and kill thousands of people with it and it people have written like books on that story right mm -hmm. so that was entirely accidental but the law that it spawns is is huge and the way people interact with it and it goes back into what we were talking about earlier about the player being the ultimate uh kind Actor of creator of this an architect mm -hmm. and director of the story mm -hmm. um, that's what i was going to say as well is that games are story machines so you know if it means that me being a creative director in games is turned into my robot pal and going make a love story and i'm going tch, 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 Cool, bro, done. Then, like, that's that's cool. But I'm, like, I'm very, you know, and I very much believe that I, I'm, I'm totally in the camp of the Terminator theory, so I believe it's all swell until that day comes. And that anyone here who has a job um, is going to be replaced by uh, or can will be at a point where you can be replaced. I don't think that there's anything untouched that, and I'm no expert in AI, so I'm just rambling up here about it. But uh, yeah, I totally feel that even you look at the early days of AI that we're sort of in now, like in its infancy as sort of like, the, you know, these crazy experiments that are going on and what's happening and what is being created. I think that it's totally feasible that, you know, mm. machines will be able to write amazing works of art. Yeah. Oh, I'm feeling so threatened. And it would be know, so helpful. I know, it's so terrifying. Terrifying. Like, like, you, know, it's me sweat. you wouldn't have to figure out all that branching dialogue yeah, yourself. <laughs> I'm also it's totally healthier. leaning into it as a coping yeah. me mechanism, so yeah, we'll no, see. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I do not approve. Not <laughs> one <laughs> bit. I like eating and living in a house <laughs> very much. Great question. Um, <laughs> there, there was an AI that won second place in a Japanese short story contest oh, uh, recently. Wow. Uh, pro, oh. Prose writing, which is pretty there you cool. Go. Next step is monkeys and Shakespeare, I guess, yeah. um, <laughs> on the typewriters. We have got another question down there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the panel so far. Uh, we've heard a lot about the collaboration between screenwriters and game designers, um, but I was wondering whether you, uh, as a I have a bias. I'm a theatre maker. Um, I was wondering why we don't see much collaboration between uh, other forms of um, artistic endeavours and theatre makers as well. I mean, we've just had Audio Jam. Um, clearly, that's uh, aimed at audio engineers. So have any of you thought about uh, working with theatre makers? Or I mean, you, you talked about them in regards to VR, mm -hmm. but I was wondering whether there was any further uh, negotiation or collaboration. And if not, why not? Um, I think that it's, it's sort of hard to answer a question as to like why is this craft not collaborating with this craft um, or can it's we tricky. do that more? Mm. And I, I think the answer is like, yeah, come at me. Like, you know, bring it, like bring it. Tell me what, how we can work together and what cool stuff we can do. That is I, such a Trent answer, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is such a Trent answer. Yeah, like I really would love someone with the th with theatre experience to, to just help. shoot me an email and say, hey, I love what you're doing at League of Geeks. I've got this really cool idea. How can we do it? And is that you, Dave? Did you ask the question? Yeah, boy. All right. <laughs> so we've collaborated, man. You know, like I guess you could call – even like just me ranting at you for an hour over coffee about like your cool new project, like I guess that's a form of collaboration, right? Right, Dave? I think we may have just seen the birth of something right yeah. here. Yeah. I, I think that also it's actually been a – like pantomime kind of is a game really. Like, yeah. you know, where's yeah. the villain? Behind you, behind you, that kind of – all in games and theatre, it, it sort of goes back into kind of – what we consider play, I think. Mm. For so here's the big reveal: I did pantomime for like ten years oh. in my family business. So wow. the greatest collab yeah. of all. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. full circle. Mm. We collaborated with a set designer to do the gardens between at the ACMI. Mateo has, you know, made us a beautiful um, 
set up oh, uh, there right, yeah. and it was absolutely gorgeous and the way that she interpreted the game you know we went to the Melbourne Theatre Company and got a whole bunch of props and set it up and it was awesome like and that essentially was theatre in a way yeah. where we created this space where um, or Matei did for the most part. I can't profess to have anything to do with that. But it was beautiful and people could sit in gardens while playing the gardens between. That was yep. that was a really interesting way to collaborate with that, you know, maybe mm. shaping it around the player experience where they're sitting physically and what they're experiencing in the game would be super cool. I'd love to see more than like that. I, yeah. Also, you can, like, um, YouTubers, uh, live playthroughs, um, Harmon Quest... Uh, Critical Role, all yeah. of these people playing games, uh, showing them the yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think actually there's a. I mean, if you if you take sort of the you know people live streaming and commentating on kind of games and um, showing their kind of D and D playthroughs as mm. theatre, which I mean, mm. especially something like Critical Role, totally is there. A lot of them are theatre practitioners. I mean, that's a really popular evidence of collaboration already i think as well it's like a lot of it isn't about collaborating together like working together for extended periods of time on a large or major project like collaboration can be like i was saying dave you know just sitting down for a coffee Chatting and shit you know yeah just you know like sharing your trade craft or it can be like you said working with mateo and like getting like this like single little project this lived experience that happens along the game's journey mm. i mean i treat whenever we work with press um like i treat that almost as a collaboration like you know i pitch them like what about this story you know i'm trying to work and understand how their what their readers want what will help them write about um, my game and it's a weird way to look at it but Mm. I, th I think those mini collaborations along the way, like Very don't helpful. try and think how do I make a huge game? You know, it's like, no, how can I work with game developers to make my theatre better? Or how is there a way that I can just, you know, have some input on a game or do something cool with a game developer? Mm. There has been interactive theatre around for uh, quite some time as well to, to varying levels of success. We've had certain stories uh, in the UK, I can't remember what it was called, but there was something where the audience votes on where the story is going to go via controllers that were in front of their um, chairs. Um, and there's also the work of Tassos Stevens, who does a lot of interactive um, mm. theatre work as well. Um, mm. And he sometimes gets the help of Twitter and that sort of thing while he's on stage. Yep. Next question, though. Sorry. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm kind of new to this whole uh, collaboration between writers and, and gamers. So my question is, uh, do you guys have any suggestions for how screenwriters could um, be working professionals as as game writers? Are there any ways to go about that or mm. is it all kind of luck and, um, mm. I don't know, meeting the right people? <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, those two things have a big part to do with it for sure at the end there, luck and um, knowing the right people. Uh, but I would also say that games are so incredibly accessible right now. They're more so than they ever have been and it's increasing exponentially every day. And so if you want to write for games, just start making games. Making games with the types of stories and the types of experiences that you want to make. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you can't code, you can use Twine. Doesn't matter yeah. if, you know, if you want to learn how to code but you want to just <coughs> dip your toes in, use something like Construct or Stencil or, you know, even if you want to go the whole hog like I gave... Jamie, the crazy advice to do and learn Unity, you know, and a bit of C-sharp programming, you can do it. And I say this to the students that I teach who want to get into games, uh, is just making games is the best way to prove that you know what you're talking about. Because I'll tell you right now, there's no shortage of writers who've never made a game but want to write for games. And as Brooke sort of touched on earlier, the technical limitations of writing for a game or the technical challenges and the technical requirements or knowledge requirements, I guess you would say, to write successfully for a game are immense. Mm. And the faster you can go through those steps, like I was talking about with the Twine game and making those first mistakes yourself, uh, the faster and better positioned you'll be to walk into a job in games. Mm. Mm. Some of, I mean, one, one thing that also occurs to me, I mean, the way that I found myself in games was writing and luck and knowing 
people, but also I had, I was writing for a really long time before that and had developed a body of work in a different medium, which also helped speak to my ability as a writer. And I still, you know, write character profiles, write synopses, write, um, you know, scripts and things like that. So having those basic skills in the craft of writing absolutely helps. Um, and writing, you know, within a, a body of work within however you like to tell story will definitely be helpful for games as well. But learning the technical and understanding the technical limitations by making a game yourself, by <laughs> definitely recommend checking out Twine. It's really accessible and easy to create an interactive story where you hyperlink between different parts where you can have a branching story you say if you can go left or go right if you want to make that basic choice so you can add many different choices Variables and you quickly see how complicated it can get mm. um oh yeah that's for free as well at yeah. twinery.org yeah. yep. um for mac and pc as well and i don't work for them <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's it's kind of a lot of the same advice as you'd give someone wanting to get into any creative pursuit in terms right. of like um, who you meet is important and luck is important, but also work hard and just learn the medium from kind of back to front. Mm, like if you play did, games too. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't know any films and didn't know how a camera worked before you wrote yeah, the screen, it'd be like go learn how cameras work, yeah. go watch a bunch of films. Like yeah. for games, you know, go learn how games work and play a bunch of games and then follow, become creative steps. I guess. And I think this is this is <laughs> yeah. this is a big mistake. I'll be very quick. This yeah. is a big mistake that I think a lot of writers trying to get into games is that they're very accom- they can be very accomplished writers outside of video games, right. and they come to the medium with the assumption of like, hey, I'm a writer, I will help. And game story sucks, so you know, here I am. Like mm. we, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> I have arrived. Oh, wait a minute. Let's Why are you changing my story? Yeah. Stop. <laughs> yeah. And so we've actually there's been a bunch of us sort of been working with the Australian Writers Guild to set up the interactive committee um, yeah. and doing a bunch of advisory there, and that's been one of the biggest things that we've had to impart is that like yeah it totally is a completely different medium that has a huge amount of knowledge required to work within it and it's not just this like thing that you can just waltz into mm. um, and expect to just ace walking off a, a, a typical um, writing gig mm. I imagine. And yeah. every game is different to write for. Yeah. I'll yes. just add that. 100%. Yeah. We've got time for one more. Um, this is my question for the teachers. Uh, whenever you encounter students who um, are so-called hardcore gamers, how do you? Uh, what kinds of techniques do you use to encourage them to step away from the typical storytelling that most mainstream games that they've encountered with um, um, uh, tell? Like, how do you make them see that there's more to storytelling than just shooting or the the usual things that you see from the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I put it on the reading list. Yeah. I put the games that I think they should be exposed to on the reading list and, and all of our literature is revolved around um, not Shooty Bang, Shooty Bang's Revenge what are, what or Shooty Bang What are some of the games on your reading list? Uh, really uh, Galatea by mm -hmm. Emily Short is an okay, amazing... Yeah, yeah. Wow, there we go. Uh, is an amazing uh, exercise in dialogue, I think, um, and there's a, yeah, there's a couple of other Great. other things that we explore. Yeah, there's a, there's a few that if you get someone who's like, I'm going to write the next Uncharted, you know, you're like, okay, well, <laughs> sit down and let's play Gone Home, Papers, Please, Dysphoria, like, mm. and just rattle off a bunch of games yeah. and have them like walk through those or sit there. And actually, <laughs> I got told after my first year teaching at VCA, they were like, all right, look, the course is, you know, you've got great feedback, but a little less playing games. We're playing a lot of games. And it's basically because <laughs> the best way to teach people who already know how to write or to show people how diverse um, storytelling can be in video games and the breadth of the toolbox, like the, the range of the toolbox that we have and its ability is to just put them through a range of vastly different experiences from the small and bespoke, bespoke to the huge, like general, even, you know, I, I sit them through a couple of sessions of The Last of Us or, mm. or Uncharted. And really when you see the possibilities within the storytelling medium, it's pretty hard to keep eager young minds constrained after that. Yep. Yeah, good answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't be a Michelin star chef and only eat Easy Mac, you know. You've got to eat some other mm. stuff. And but the, your Easy uh, Mac I, is going to be real good. It's going to be tasty. It'll be yeah. real tasty. <laughs> um, we've, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, but thank you for your company tonight in this discussion and for putting up with 
all that coughing. Um, it's it's <laughs> my name's Lena Van Deventer, and it's been an absolute pleasure to host this evening with you tonight. Um, thank you to the Wheeler Centre and the Victorian College of the Arts for uh, putting uh, for partnering together and, and putting this on tonight. Um, and last but definitely not least, please join me in thanking our panelists, James Cockier, Brooke Mags, and Trent Custers. Thank you. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.